Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya Madad. According to a World Bank report, over 700 million people live on less than $1.90 a day, which is how they define extreme poverty. Now, in this context, one might ask what justification could there be for investing resources in parks, museums, uh, music, architecture, etc., all of which, as you know, are part of the endeavors of the Ismaili Imamat. Uh, in this talk, I propose that this is based on a particular conception of cosmopolitan ethics, which I believe informed the programs of the AKDN and the Jamaat. So what is cosmopolitan ethics? Uh, let's start by exploring its roots and its contours. It is said that someone asked the 4th century BC Greek philosopher Diogenes where he came from and where he thought he belonged. In response, Diogenes is believed to have said that he was a cosmopolites, a citizen of the world. This is where the English word cosmopolitan is derived from. I suspect, however, that Diogenes did not quite mean what this word means to us today. I mean, surely he did not live in a cosmopolitan society in ancient Greece. Uh, perhaps what he was trying to suggest was that he identified with the wider humanity rather than a narrow commitment only to his fellow citizens. Uh, increasingly, many of us live in cosmopolitan societies, meaning societies in which we share the same physical space with people of diverse nationalities, cultures, ethnicities, religions, etc. Uh, by this definition, according to an October 2018 report produced by McKinsey and Company, Dubai is currently the world's most cosmopolitan city, with foreign-born residents making up 83% of its population. Its residents come from more than 200 countries and speak more than 140 different languages. According to the same report, Brussels is the next most cosmopolitan city with a population that is 62% foreign-born, hailing from some 140 countries, speaking 86 different languages. Now, I'm sure a lot of us who live in sprawling metropolises uh, find ourselves in similar environments. Now, there can be different responses to living in such conditions. There are those who feel threatened by this diversity and develop narrow nationalistic or even xenophobic attitudes. Uh, then there are those who have developed a global outlook, shunning narrow prejudices and are welcoming of diversity. They recognize the moral worth of every individual and respect the human rights of all. In recent times, this has been referred to as a cosmopolitan attitude, that is, the attitude of people who see themselves as citizens of the world, as cosmopolitans. Uh, now, a critique of this attitude has been to suggest that these individuals have no commitments to their nations and do not belong anywhere. The famous Scottish philosopher Alasdair MacIntyre called them rootless citizens of nowhere. I think, however, that this is based on a misunderstanding of the concept of cosmopolitanism. You see, to be a cosmopolitan does not suggest that there is a global state of which these individuals claim citizenship. I mean, clearly, there is no such entity. Uh, citizenship here, I think, is used to include the ideas of responsibility and commitment to all people of the world and a refusal to prioritize parochial concerns that may be damaging to distant others. As the British political theorist Lord Bhikkhu Parekh puts it, they are globally oriented citizens. A cosmopolitan attitude is not, as some have argued, anti-patriotic or against national identities. It is, Lord Parekh says, the attitude of those who work within their national context to encourage global agendas such as foreign policies that are respectful of the moral worth of all human beings. Uh, perhaps a good description of this attitude is what I read in the introduction to an edited volume mm -hmm. entitled mm -hmm. Questioning Cosmopolitanism by Stan Van Hoof and uh, Wim uh, van der Kirkchhoff. They write, in our view, contemporary cosmopolitans evince a form of subjectivity that comprises all or most of the 
following attitudes. They are suspicious of nationalism, uh, all forms of chauvinism, and even patriotism. They refuse to see the national, economic, and military interests of their country as more important than global values such as human rights, global justice, and the protection of the global environment. And they refuse to give their co-nationals any priority in their concerns or responsibilities at the expense of more distant others. They respect basic human rights. They see them as universally normative and acknowledge the moral equality of all peoples and individuals. They consider the people of the world as united by reason, sociability, and a common humanity and believe in a globally acceptable concept of human dignity. In my view, the value system that underpins this attitude of globally oriented citizenship is what is called cosmopolitan ethics. Now, let me take a few minutes here to clarify some terminology. In our everyday conversations, we use certain terms interchangeably, such as values, ethics, and morals. But I think it is important for us to understand the difference between these terms to understand the notions of cosmopolitan ethics and its relationship to uh, values such as pluralism, which is a value that Morana Hazar Imam has promoted both within and beyond the Jamaat. Now, values are simply what the word in English means, something of value, something for which we are willing to exert effort to acquire or retain. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we value family unity and will go a long way to preserve it. Uh, then there are other values such as honesty, integrity, kindness, justice, etc., which have a moral dimension. In the same vein, pluralism, that is respecting and valuing diversity, is a value. Now, some values are universally accepted while others are not. Uh, pluralism is a classic example of a value that is not universally accepted, even though you and I might think that it should be. Also, all of us do not value the same things equally. Uh, this is important, particularly in situations where there is a conflict of values. Uh, take, for instance, the value of time and money. Both are values for us, but each one of us might value them differently. If I can save one hour of my time by paying someone, say, 25 pounds to do some work, like uh, mowing the lawn, I might be willing to do that uh, because I might value my time more than that 25 pounds. For someone else, however, they might think that it is too much of a price to pay for one hour of work. And now, this is just a simple, perhaps even simplistic example of how we value values differently. Uh, life, of course, is uh, much more complicated and sometimes presents us with situations where much more important values are in conflict. Uh, for instance, when as citizens, we have to make choices between our rights to privacy and our security. The process that we go through to arrive at our decision in such situations of conflict of values is what is called ethics. Uh, once you have gone through this process, particularly for a situation where values with a moral dimension are in conflict, the conclusion that you arrive at becomes your moral. You can see that because we value values differently, our morals are likely to be different. Uh, in this sense, morals are personal. Now, Let's return to the idea of cosmopolitan ethics. Uh, as I said earlier, this is the ethical framework that guides the decision-making process for those who consider themselves to be globally oriented citizens. In his book, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, uh, Kwame Apia, the anglo ghanian American philosopher, presents a useful explanation uh, of this concept. Uh, according to him, in the framework of cosmopolitan ethics, every human being matters. All people have needs such as health, food, etc., uh, which have to be met for them to lead decent lives. They should have the option to exercise their human capability and be protected from harm and obstacles. 
Uh, in the same way, Stan van Hooft, uh, Emeritus Professor at uh, Deakin University, notes that uh, cosmopolitan ethics require institutions and individuals not to do anything that prevents the exercise of human capabilities, which gives dignity and worth to human life, and in fact should provide whatever assistance or resources are needed for such exercise. I think this is what Morana Hazar Imam refers to as our moral responsibility to all human beings, recognizing and honoring our common humanity. Uh, now, some have found this foundational principle of cosmopolitan ethics to be idealistic and, and unworkable. Uh, for instance, the American historian Gertrude Himmerfarm uh, writes, uh, what cosmopolitanism obscures even denies are the givens of life, parents, ancestors, family, race, religion, heritage, history, culture, traditions, community, and nationality. These are not accidental attributes of the individual, they are essential attributes. I think she is right that we do have particular commitments and uh, loyalties to our families and our communities, which we cannot ignore. But you see, expressing a commitment to all of humanity is not necessarily a rejection of our other commitments. All of us, all of us have plural identities as part of families, religious traditions, or nation states. These identities are all nested within our wider identity as human beings. So affirming our identity as a citizen of the world does not require us to deny our other identities and commitments. As the famous Indian economist Amartya Sen puts it, primary allegiance does not eliminate the possibility of other allegiances. Uh, in fact, the values that underpin our loyalties and commitments to those other entities, such as uh, caring for relatives, loyalty to one's country, etc., can surely be absorbed in the set of values that are amalgamated in cosmopolitan ethics, uh, as these are likely to be shared by those amongst whom we live. But at the same time, we must recognize that we live in an age where our behavior and actions can impact distant others. As we saw not too long ago, uh, some ill-considered cartoons published in Europe can cause upheavals in many other countries. Something we write on social media can cause challenges for members of a community in other parts of the world. Uh, similarly, our constant demand for lower prices for products might mean that people who produce those products might get paid even less or have their human rights violated so that products can be manufactured cheaply. So those distant strangers have as much right to be included in the scope of our ethical considerations as those who are close to us. And this is not just a personal view. It is also reflected in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, which asserts that recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. So it should come as no surprise to us that Morana Hazar Imam has also championed this notion of cosmopolitan ethics. Uh, let's listen to extracts from the 2015 Jodidi lecture delivered by Morana Hazar Imam at Harvard University in the USA, where he lays out his understanding of the idea of uh, cosmopolitan ethics. What all of this means is that the challenge of living well together, a challenge as old as the human race, can seem more and more complicated. And so we ask ourselves, what are the resources that we might now draw upon to counter this trend? How can we go beyond our bold words and address the mystery of why our ideals still elude us? In responding to that question, I would ask you to think with me about the term I have used in the title of this lecture, The Cosmopolitan Ethic. 
For a very long time, as you know, the term most often used in describing the search for human understanding was the word tolerance. In fact, it was one of the words that was used in the 1955 text to describe one of the objectives of this Jadidi lecture. In recent years, our vocabulary in discussing this subject has evolved. One word that we have come to use more often in this regard is the word pluralism, and the other is the word cosmopolitan. You may know that our AKDN network a decade ago cooperated with the government of Canada to create a new global center for pluralism based in Ottawa, designed to study more closely the conditions under which pluralist societies can thrive. A pluralist cosmopolitan society is a society which not only accepts difference, but actively seeks to understand it and to learn from it. In this perspective, diversity is not a burden to be endured, but an opportunity to be welcomed. A cosmopolitan society regards the distinctive threads of our particular identities as elements that bring beauty to the larger social fabric. A cosmopolitan ethic accepts our ultimate moral responsibility to the whole of humanity, rather than absolutizing a presumably exceptional part. Perhaps it is a natural condition of an insecure human race to seek security in a sense of superiority. But in a world where cultures increasingly interpenetrate one another, a more confident and a more generous outlook is needed. What this means, perhaps all else, is a readiness to participate in a true dialogue with diversity, not only in our personal relationships, but in institutional and international relationships also. But that takes work, and it takes patience. Above all, it implies a readiness to listen. What is needed, as the former Governor General of Canada, Adrian Clarkson, has said, and I quote, is a readiness to listen to your neighbor even when you may not particularly like him. Is that message clear? <laughs> you listen to people you don't like. A thoughtful cosmopolitan ethic is something quite different from some attitudes that have become associated with the concept of globalization in recent years. Too often that term has been linked to an abstract universalism, perhaps well-meaning, but rather naive. In emphasizing all that the human race has in common, it was easy to depreciate the identities that differentiated us. We sometimes talk so much about how we were all alike, that we neglected the wonderful ways in which we can be different. A responsible, thoughtful process of globalization, in my view, is one that is truly cosmopolitan, respecting both what we have in common and what makes us different. A cosmopolitan ethic will also be sensitive to the problem of economic insecurity in our world. It is an enormous contributing factor to the problems I have been discussing. Let me repeat in conclusion that a cosmopolitan ethic is one that will honor both our common humanity and our distinctive identities, each reinforcing the other as part of the same high moral calling. The central lesson of my own personal journey over many miles and many years, is the indispensability of such an ethic in our changing world, based on the timeless truth 
that we are, each of us and all of us, born of a single soul. Thank you. Please do take the time to watch the whole speech on the AKDN website. Now, based on these extracts, to my mind, the key points that uh, emerge from Mulana Hazar Imam's articulation of cosmopolitan ethics are the following. First, each one of us has a moral responsibility to the whole of humanity and that this is not an abstract universalism. Second, we should honor our common humanity, recognizing and respecting what we have in common. Third, we must understand and accept the differences and distinctive identities amongst our communities and societies. Fourth, there should be a willingness to participate in dialogue and to listen to diverse views, including the views of those who we may not like. The fifth point, in our work, we need to be sensitive to the challenges of economic insecurity and its consequences. And sixth, that we should seek to integrate the best values of the different units of the communities and societies in which we live. Now, this last point is perhaps the one that most people associate with the notion of cosmopolitan ethics. And it is indeed an important element. Now, earlier I mentioned pluralism as a value that Mawlana Hazar Imam has promoted. But in the spirit of pluralism, we do not have to accept or tolerate everything. So, for instance, we may be welcoming of diverse political philosophies, but what if someone seeks to implement undemocratic and dictatorial forms of government? Should we accept that as well? Now, here there is clearly a conflict of values. On the one hand, we value the spirit of pluralism. On the other, we also value democratic forms of government in, in civilized societies. So we need some ethical framework that can help us address this ethical dilemma. Uh, clearly, pluralism cannot mean anything goes. There have to be some limits or boundaries. The question is, who sets those limits or draws those boundaries? Well, one way to do this in a community or society is to identify and agree on the values that we can collectively uphold. Then any behavior or attitude that crosses that boundary would not be tolerated, even while pluralism is a value we imbibe. Now, you might ask, what does all this mean for us in practical terms? Well, as individuals, if we wish to live by cosmopolitan ethics, it means that we carefully consider our behaviors and actions to ensure that they are not inadvertently harming people whom we don't know, that we contribute our fair share of taxes and community services, that we do our part by contributing resources and efforts to promote human rights, equity, and social justice, that we imbibe the spirit of pluralism and do what we can to ensure that people are not marginalized or discriminated against, that we listen to alternative views, even those that we don't like, that we work to understand and live by the shared values of our societies for peace, harmony, and so on. If you're part of business corporations, we can exhibit cosmopolitan ethics by paying a fair share of corporate taxes rather than chasing tax avoidance schemes, by ensuring that people are paid a fair living wage for their services, by diversifying our workforce at all levels and ensuring that their diverse viewpoints and needs are considered by helping employees to develop their potential, which would enhance the dignity and quality of their lives, by ensuring that our processes, products and services are not harming people, whether it be our employees, customers or people working in our supply chains by fulfilling our social responsibilities, not just for a good corporate image, but out of genuine care for people in the wider society and so on. So being a cosmopolitan and living by the corresponding ethical framework is neither easy, nor does it come naturally to us, but it is 
equally important to recognize the limits of this framework. Uh, in his book, uh, Practical Ethics, Peter Singer, who is a professor of bioethics at uh, Princeton University and is best known for his writings about global poverty, presents an interesting argument which goes as follows. Suppose, he says, I notice that a small child has fallen in a shallow pond and is in danger of drowning. Would anyone deny that I ought to wade in and pull the child out? A plausible principle that would support the judgment that I ought to pull the child out is this. If it is in our power to prevent something very bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral significance, we ought to do it. Now, this principle applies not just to rare situations in which one can save a child from a pond, but to the everyday situation in which we can assist those living in absolute poverty. Our affluence means that we have income we can dispose of without giving up the basic necessities of life. And we can use this income to reduce absolute poverty. Just how much we will think ourselves obliged to give up will depend on what we consider to be of comparable moral significance to the poverty we could, we could prevent. Stylish clothes, expensive dinners, a sophisticated stereo system, overseas holidays, a second car, a larger house, private schools for our children, and so on. So basically, Peter Singer is arguing that if you are a true cosmopolitan concerned about people in distant lands who are suffering from abject poverty, you ought to give up all your conveniences beyond basic necessities to help those people. Now, this is akin to the question uh, with which I started this talk. Why invest in parks, cultural activities, etc., and not focus just on helping those who live in ultra poverty? After all, as the Imam says, we have a moral responsibility to the whole of humanity. You can see that this type of application of cosmopolitan ethics can be quite challenging. Now, in response, Kwame Apia presents a number of constraints on the implementation of this idea of cosmopolitanism. Amongst these constraints is the idea that the primary means to address the needs of human beings remains the nation state. As individuals, we might be able to save a child who is at risk of drowning in a shallow pond, but we are not best equipped as individuals to save all the children across the world who might be dying of uh, malnutrition or diseases. As cosmopolitans, we must ask, why are these children dying? Apia notes that drought is a natural phenomenon and can affect any part of the world, but famines rarely happen in states that have good governance. So he argues that a better use of our resources may be to support efforts that encourage good governance. And indeed, this is what we have seen Morana Hazar Imam do in parts of the world where many people live in ultra poverty because he believes that the solution lies not just in giving charity to help the poor, although that is also important, but in enhancing civil society and improving state governance so that they can address the root causes of poverty. Uh, take the Al Azhar Park in Cairo as an example of a civil society institution. Not only does it provide a green space for people to enjoy, but it has created jobs, revived traditional arts, and improved living conditions for thousands in the adjoining Darbal Ahmar district. Uh, secondly, Apia argues uh, cosmopolitan ethics does not require us as individuals to carry the whole burden alone. Each one of us has to do their fair share. So for example, if some people in society do not pay their fair share of taxes, we as individuals do not have the obligation to make up the difference. But we do have the obligation to pay our fair share of taxes and we must do our part in encouraging everyone to contribute their fair, fair share as well. And if you look at what Morana Hazar Imam has done over the past six decades, to help those in need, there is no doubt that he has done 
his fair share. And in fact, much more than that. Uh, as a result of his endeavors, the lives of many millions have been improved. Uh, surely no one can expect more of him uh, in this regard. The next constraint that uh, has been identified by Apia on the application of cosmopolitan ethics is that our basic obligations must take account of our partiality towards those who are close to us, such as our family, our community, and our compatriots, to whom we have particular commitments. Uh, amongst those to whom we have an obligation is our own selves. Cosmopolitan ethics does not require us to undermine our own or our family's quality of life to help improve those of others, because in doing so, we may compromise our own ability to help others. Now, of course, this applies to the Ismaili Imamat as well. The Imam has commitments not just to the underprivileged across the world, but a particular commitment to all of his murids as well, both in the East and in the West. And in the spirit of equity, his institutional endeavors provide support and services for the different segments of the Jamaat according to their needs. The needs of the Jamaat in Afghanistan are not the same as the needs of the Jamaat in America. And the spirit of cosmopolitan ethics is to provide whatever assistance or resources are needed to enable people to exercise their capabilities according to their context. Uh, in my view, his creativity is in establishing institutions that not only serve the local community, but also enhance their capacity to be of service to others. Uh, take the concept of the time and knowledge in Nazrana, which was conceived by Murana Hazrima. Not only does it facilitate high quality services for the local community, but creates a bridge for the transfer of knowledge across different parts of the world. Finally, Apia notes that as cosmopolitans, we cannot ignore other values in our lives. Life cannot just be about reducing poverty or saving children. Uh, think of the kind of world where there is no beauty, no art, no entertainment, and no stunning architecture. Uh, quite apart from the dullness of our collective experiences, what would that do to all those who are employed in these fields of endeavor or otherwise rely on these aspects of life for their livelihood? This is why the Ismaili Imamat is invested not just in poverty alleviation, but also in cultural activities, architecture, music, etc. This is also consistent with the Imamat's broader definition of quality of life, which is not just the standard of living, but includes the capacity to do things that one wishes to do, such as freedom of thought and speech and the capacity to practice one's faith and also protection from indignity, uh, discrimination and, uh, and so on. A few months ago, I visited the 700 year old Baltith Fort in Hunza, which has been restored as part of the Aga Khan Historic Cities program. Apart from attracting over 15,000 visitors every year, I witnessed how this restoration has been a source of cultural pride for the local community. It has improved the roads and infrastructure for the local in inhabitants. And it has contributed to preserving indigenous values and traditional building practices. It has also created income generating opportunities, particularly for women from poor households. I remember meeting a lady who now runs a very small cafe near the Baltis Fort, which does brisk business. I was told by the tour guides that the project has also involved women in non-traditional activities, such as uh, topographic and building service, carpentry, hospitality, and tourism. So you can see how these sorts of projects, while not addressing poverty directly, have the potential to positively transform the lives of people in the entire neighborhood. And in this way, it is entirely consistent with the conception of cosmopolitan ethics that I have described. With these constraints, the application of cosmopolitan ethics becomes realistically possible. And in our interconnected and cosmopolitan societies, this framework can be very valuable and perhaps even essential. 
In his book, uh, Mankind and Mother Earth, the famous British historian and philosopher Arnold Toynbee notes that there are inherent dangers in our increasing interconnectedness and calls for developing ways to address them peacefully. He laments what he calls a morality gap in world affairs that can mediate between our growing capabilities for destruction and the evil purposes for which it can be used. Uh, perhaps uh, cosmopolitan ethics can provide a shared moral framework to address these challenges. Let me conclude with the following quote from the Bengali poet and Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore, uh, which presents his understanding of cosmopolitanism. Uh, Tagore writes, we must know that the great mind of man is one, working through the many differences which are needed to ensure the full result of its fundamental unity. When we understand this truth in a disinterested spirit, it teaches us to respect all the differences in man that are real, yet remain conscious of our oneness, and to know that perfection of unity is not in uniformity, but in harmony. I hope you have found this brief exploration of cosmopolitan ethics useful. Thank you for listening to this talk. Yali Madad.